All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our first of the uh, A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lectures for this semester. Uh, it's we didn't. We would have loved to start it in the very first week of school. There's some construction that's happening in our normal auditorium, and for various reasons, today is the quote first day of class. I'm glad that you found found out where it is and the location. Um, I'm going to uh, give you ten minutes of just intro to the class, just in case, uh, just in, just in case you're in the wrong class, but um, j just so you know what the class is about, and then I'm going to introduce our first. Um, speaker for this series, okay? All right, so um, you're in the, uh, oh, I'm Iklak Sidhu, and I'm basically your instructor for the course, and I'm the director of, for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. So you are in the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. There's three sections to this, E98, 198, 298. I assume that you're in the appropriate ones. Uh, you can take it. Um, it's mostly taken pass-fail. I think there's versions where you can take it um, for letter grade as well. Um, but you should be taking it for one unit. Um, let's see here. So uh, the course is offered through Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. Um, and if you don't know about the center, I hope that you'll take some time and learn a little bit more. This is almost like a intro into other things that we have in the center. But a lot of students take various classes in the CET, approximately eight every semester. There's a venture lab. Um, there, uh, there's a lot of people that watch these uh, speaker, um, the, the speaker um, lectures uh, actually online. We've had more than a million hits of our lecture series. So we, we video these and we um, uh, uh, have them on YouTube, and they even get advertised, I think, on uh, UCTV and, and so forth. So it, it's actually quite a very popular series, and we've been doing it for, I don't know, like six or seven years. And all um, I can personally say that I, I really enjoy all of the, the speakers, and, um, and I get something. I personally get something out of each one of these. I hope that you will also. Um, we also have a lot of alumni out of CET, so it's about 4,000 now. Um, and many of them, you know, quite a few of our alumni have started companies, and they're all over in the Silicon Valley area. Okay, um, one thing that we're doing in the center is that we're developing something called, or we have developed over all these years, a Berkeley method of entrepreneurship. It's ingrained, or it's it's uh, woven through all of the courses that we offer. Um, if you get a chance, you should go to the cet.berkeley.edu website. It's basically a virtual CET. Um, you can understand a little bit about the method, and you could also understand um, uh, there. You could also see, and this is the other slide. You can also see the courses every semester that are offered. But if I go back to the last slide, um, this uh, website it's more than it's more than just a website. You can log into it. You can get an account in it. And as you take classes and you do projects, you can actually build your companies virtually inside this site. And so in a way, it's like Facebook hidden. You know, I can't say it's as successful as Facebook, but it's, um, it has the idea of Facebook built in that you can build profiles and that um, uh, teams can form. You can connect people together. There's um, people who are investors or there are people who are first customers or you know all kinds of um, uh, uh, other resources that you can use as starting for starting companies. So it's part of um, our infrastructure. Um, another type of course, if I don't know how many, have any of you taken any of our challenge courses? Probably a, few, a couple of people back here, um, one there. So one of the categories of classes that we have is a challenge lab. And um, quite often, we have an external or an internally oriented challenge. It can be a big data. It can be a health topic. And uh, we use that, that class format to get a solution. It's some very interesting types of challenges. I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I just want to introduce you to some of the other things going on in the center. Um, and about this course specifically, um, I think you should know A. Richard Newton, just um, since it's the, the A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series. Uh, uh, 
Richard Newton uh, was the, first of all, he was the dean at the time when we founded the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. So he was the dean during 2005, and he had been the dean for you know, five or six before, years before that. Um, he's really like an all-star academic. He, um, he had developed some of the simulation software that, frankly, every chip that's ever been developed has used some, some root of that code that, that was developed. Um, and besides being um, a, a very well-respected, famous academic, he was also, and this is rare, a very well-connected industry person as well because he had founded both Cadence and Synopsys, who, which are two very significant firms in Silicon Valley, as well as like three or four other firms, Crossbow and I think Pi. I, I don't remember the whole list, but he, he was basically a serial entrepreneur and he was both department head and dean and so forth. Um, and it just so happens that um, he, got pan he um, got pancreatic cancer um, and, uh, and it was all very sudden. And in only uh, three months or so between um, finding out that, that he had it, um, uh, he passed away. And so um, among a, a, lot, a lot of things are, are named after Richard Newton, and certainly we're really happy that, that this series, which he was part of from the very beginning, uh, is named after him. Um, our model is, of course, to bring executives, uh, entrepreneurs, so forth, um, innovators, investors in, into the classroom. Um, this is a way that we do that. Um, we have approximately, let's see, I'll just count them, I think seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven speakers. Um, I'm going to introduce the, um, the first of the distinguished speakers momentarily. In terms of location, um, today we're doing it here in, um, in Bonita Auditorium. We're most likely going to have most of the speakers in Skydeck. Uh, on the top, so we'll send you email. You still got till March 11th for your next, uh, you know, before the next class session. So there, there's enough time, but watch out for email from us because um, we have to make some adjustments in terms of the location. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, if you can try to arrive um, early enough, um, and uh, it's only because sometimes it just takes time for. Um, just to check in and, and to get things and, and to basically the sooner that everyone gets here, the sooner we can start. Um, let's see. This is, um, I think you can, oh, okay. Um, the one thing is after each of the class sessions, you'll get an email and uh, you have to fill out a survey and, it, and the survey uh, asks you for some information about what, to help summarize what you got out of the lecture. So um, that is effectively the homework of the class. That's, that's a, I guess, a significant part of the homework. The other thing that we're going to ask you to do, um, besides be here, uh, attendance is, is uh, necessary. If, if you have to be gone, tell us in advance, um, and we'll make a way for you to watch the lecture when um, uh, uh, the lecture that you missed and to basically do the same survey. The one other thing, okay, now the one other thing that um, we're going to ask you to do is one project. So you've got seven lectures that you're going to watch here. And um, we're going to ask you to watch five other videos. But we're not going to tell you which five that you have to watch. And I don't even mean five distinguished innovator lecture series videos. What we'd like you to do is find five videos on the internet. Just from anywhere that have to do with entrepreneurship. Okay? Can, now, I'll give you a list of topics. And we're going to give you these slides so you can, you'll see the, the list of topics. But you pick five videos in a sub-area of entrepreneurship. And what we want you to do is write a paragraph to half a page on each of those five. So you can do that anywhere. You watch the video, write a paragraph on, on basically what was insightful, what, what did you get out of that. And the third thing is, out of that, tell us which of those five was the most interesting, valuable to you. We want to know, what, out of those five, which one you thought would be most helpful either to you or to other people. And we're basically, in a way, crowdsourcing um, the, an understanding of what videos you find interesting, 
and helpful so that we can help build a multimedia library of resources that are useful for entrepreneurs. And frankly, you are the customers of, um, of the content. So I think only you can tell us um, which of these materials are the most helpful to you. OK, and we're going to ask you to send that to us by April 4th. So seven lectures here, five lectures. You find them on the internet. And um, these are, here, this is a slow build. Hold on. So like I said, I'll, I'll send these slides out. Oops. OK, go back. OK, so I'll send these out. But here's a, a whole list, you know, so you can watch five videos on opportunity recognition, five videos on how to build a brand, five, you, know, you can pick any of these topics, go look for five videos, tell us of those five which one you like the best. That's the one project for, for the class, okay? And um, uh, I'll, you know, maybe in a future class I'll remind you, obviously you can ask me offline or, you know, on the, um, at, at really at any time. Um, but that's, that's effectively the whole class. Um, before I introduce our speaker, which is fundamentally why you're here, um, uh, any questions? Is there anything that I can help answer? I think it's a fairly simple class, but. Ah, yeah. Uh, do we have to watch five videos from one topic, or can we watch five from various different topics? So I would, I, I, we want you to watch five from the same topic, because um, it'll be hard to say which are the best of the five if they're across all. So if you find five on, on brand building or the closest thing to it, then at least the one that you recommend as the best one would be out of something, you know, apples to apples and, you know, so forth. Okay? All right. Yeah? Uh-huh. Which variation of the type of letter grade? Which very, what's that? Like, which variation of the type of letter grade? Um, you know, actually, I can't tell you uh, um, standing here. It's, um, I'm not sure, fundamentally. Um, so I think either see me or Victoria offline and we can get you the answer. All right? Are we restricted to these topics? Or if we go to another topic, uh, are you open to having us like, you know, email offline perhaps? Amazingly enough, I am open to that. If, if you would, you know, if you think that there's something really interesting that's happening in the entrepreneurial space, you can send me a note and say, I want to do mine on this. And as long as it's not something really strange, like, you know, whatever, like how to paint your house, fine. You, you, okay. All right? Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce our um, distinguished speaker here. So um, it's really my pleasure to be able to introduce to you um, Bill Rue. Bill is uh, Vice President and Corporate Officer of GE Software. Um, and one, you know, one, one thing, GE has been leading in this area of machine-to-machine -machine communications. And Bill has been leading GE to um, do all of this work in this area. We think this is a really important new emerging area. And so you know, we really thought about who we could go to and have a lecture on this topic. And so first of all, um, Bill, we're really appreciative that you could come and you know, you're really just the right person to talk about this here. You know, last semester, if, if you're aware, you know, we picked very particular topics to illuminate different things that are going on in the entrepreneurial or in the technology space. And you know, this time, we're picking machine to machine as basically our, our kickoff area. So, um, so he's going to, obviously, um, he's going to talk about this topic. But um, he's got plenty of experience to draw from to talk about it. Um, in addition to his current role um, running this portion of GE, uh, he's run the global services, global service solutions part of Cisco. He's been a CTO at both Concept5 and also at uh, Software AG. He's on the Fung Institute Advisory Board, of which the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology is within it. And he's on the uh, Dean's Advisory Board for the College of Engineering. Um, so overall, I don't know what else I can say except thanks for coming. And please, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, assume this will move the little. This is how we do it, I'm told. All right. Wait five seconds and, and you should be in business. Yeah, I'm not going to touch anything. So, um, so as these come up, and hopefully they'll come up, um, you know, how many of you uh, know who Clayton Christensen is? I'm curious. Uh, well, good. So, Clayton Christensen. All right. So, um, yeah, I, one of the things I want to talk about is, is with regard to the topic of entrepreneurship, is not just what I'm doing in GE and all on machine to machine, but put it in the context of uh, this idea of intrapreneurship, which, you know, entrepreneurship is often about little companies and startups, and I've been in them, I've created. Uh, one, I've been, uh, I've been, I was recruited into another in the mid part of my career, um, and in the last decade, uh, my career has moved to entrepreneurship, which is how do you create something new in a big company? And Clayton Christensen, if you didn't get a chance, if you if you don't know who he is, it's probably worthwhile to look at it. There's probably some interesting TED talks and others related to what he talks about. This idea of a book, famous book. Uh, probably written before you were born, called The Innovator's Dilemma. And The Innovator's Dilemma, that was a joke, by the way. So The Innovator's Dilemma is about... Yeah. yeah. That's why it was a joke. So uh, they'll get my sense of humor sooner or later. But the fact is that he wrote this book, The Innovator's Dilemma, and basically it's why do big companies fail? Why can't big companies innovate? Why do only little companies innovate? Now, it is not entirely true that big companies don't innovate. Uh, GE, you know, well, if you just look at GE, you know, Edison uh, is the one who created GE. Um, and, uh, and if you look, I mean, he created, uh, if you look at the industries, he uh, redefined the locomotive industry, GE's number one locomotives. He, he built the whole appliance industry and lighting industry. He created the what utility model we have today. He created uh, the first X-ray machine, uh, amongst other things. So he created uh, the movie industry. He created uh, a good eight or ten industries as opposed to many innovators today who create one or two. So he, in many ways, was the earliest version of an entrepreneur creating these industries. And GE's been around a long time, and you don't stay around you know, 140 years without changing. Okay, so not every big company is uh, unable to change, but most aren't. And I want you to think about you know the idea that uh, Polaroid and Kodak had most of the patents on digital cameras. You know, how many people here think the first thing I'm going to do is buy a Polaroid digital or a Kodak digital camera? You know, it, you don't think about that. And quite honestly, neither of those companies are successful, and both are on the ropes in terms of of uh, probably non-sustainable business models. Because every day they got up and at Kodak, uh, I, I know some of the engineers, they'd come in and say, here, we need to build a digital camera. And the, literally the senior leadership would go, yeah, but where's the film in it? And the guy would go, well, there is no film. And they go, but we make money on film. But how do you make money on this? Well, you sell cameras. Well, we don't make any money on cameras. We make money on film. So where's the film? It was sort of that discussion that went on. And sooner or later, small companies come in and say, well, I can do this. And then they go take it forward. So the idea of how do you begin in a big company to make a shift and innovate, because if big companies don't change, they sort of go out of business. And there's plenty of examples of this. And, uh, you know, just think, uh, and then you might say, well, you know, you go hire, uh, you know, a big consultant. They come in, they do a study, and they tell you what to do. And, I, you know, there are plenty of big consultants who went out to all the big retailers, and we'll talk a little more about this, and said, you know, a lot of people are going to get online and buy stuff. And they said, but no, nah, no, nah, they won't. We, we've talked to our customers. They want more stuff in stores. They want bigger stores. They want cheaper stuff in stores. Well, if the problem with your customers, if all they can imagine is stores and they can't imagine a new thing, if you got rid of the word in stores and they could see beyond it, they would have said, oh, what they want is more stuff. I can put more stuff online than I can put in a store. I can get it cheaper in a store and I can go win. So this idea of innovation, entrepreneurship in big companies is an opportunity, and I'll talk a little bit about my own journey there because I've been an entrepreneur, and now I've moved in to be an entrepreneur in a company, and I'm trying to make that change. So 
one of the things that's important in any, or in any company is to realize uh, when is transformation occurring. The way, by the way, I believe you become a real entrepreneur and you grow a big company or an entrepreneur and you change a bit, uh, grow a little company into a big company or change a big company is through finding the transformation that's occurring. And in the end, if you can't get on the right transformation at the right time, essentially it is really hard. You might get something small and interesting, but you become a me too. So the question is, how do you identify industry transformations? And then how do you get somebody to believe in it? And my journey into GE is I was hired three years ago. And the company knew something was going on, but they didn't quite know what it meant. And, and I'll, I'll frame it up this way. They said... Uh, one thing people don't know is GE makes all its profits, or not all of it, about 80% of its profits on the industrial side uh, off of its services. So we sell a jet aircraft engine, but we make most of the profits on the services. We sell locomotives, we make most of the profits on the service. We sell wind turbines, make most of the profits on the services. And so what we're finding is that people were using data to, to come in and sell new kinds of services. And so at the top, our chairman and CEO, uh, Jeff Immelt, our, our, uh, our CTO of the company, Mark Little, said, boy, something's happening here. We ought to get, figure it out. And, but they knew inside the company, the people who were looking at services, they kept thinking, how do I sell more services to fix your product? They weren't thinking, how do I take and figure out how to use software and analytics to deliver new services? And this became the challenge, and I came in, and I was just told, go figure it out. I was literally told that much. I was, three years ago, one person. I'll talk about my journey on this a little bit and talk to you about what it takes from my viewpoint to be an entrepreneur in a big company, but also talk about how do you make a decision whether you can be an entrepreneur or not. So when I looked at it, I, I started with, looking at what was happening in the market, looking at what was happening. And it was, it was clear that our businesses, there was a trend that was occurring. And this trend uh, three years ago, nowadays, you know, everybody in this room has heard the term big data. Anybody not heard the term big data? I'm curious. You know, there isn't a conference in any industry that isn't about big data because that's the big topic. Three years ago, it was very early on. And when we looked at GE, we said, I said, well, let's look at what's happening with data at GE. And take the aviation business. When we look at selling a jet aircraft engine and maintaining it, even five, six years ago, the only data we got off of it was average takeoff, cruise, and landing data. Very few data that we could use to figure out what to do. But what happened over the last five years is that we started to get this amount of data that we used to get three parameters that were very broad. And now, I'm sure you all know what a TBV demand is, right? I mean, I, I see this, I don't know what it all means, but we are seeing enormous amount of data off an aircraft engine. If you take, a, uh, if you take any flight we see, and we downloaded for every flight, we would download 100 uh, gigabytes per flight off of our aircraft engine for every flight if we just collected it all. Now you take that across and you look, it's a lot of data. It's more data than anything else that exists out there that comes off of big machines. And so you start to look at this and what was the data used for? Is everything normal? Right? Is every, and so they used to just look at it immediately, say is everything normal and throw it away. And most businesses do that. But what we're finding, and I'm going to talk about this, is this data is very valuable to keep. It's an asset you don't want to throw away, you want to pull out. So what we're seeing is that sensors are going everywhere. Today people talk about the Internet of Things. Connecting machines is not really all that interesting. Having a beer spigot, connecting the Internet, see whether it's pouring or not pouring is cool, but not very interesting. The interesting part is when you start to build new sensors and get insight into what's going on, you collect that data and you use it, and we'll talk about this trend, to deliver a whole new kind of service. Now, interestingly enough, companies who are data-driven are worth a lot more, and if I showed you the statistics, are worth increasingly more than companies who don't use data in their business. So 
what we see is that there's a lot of data, a lot more information, a lot more sensors, and you, those who were figuring out how to use that data, we found, were developing new services that were competing with our capabilities on the edges. And we realized that we didn't want to be Kodak or a retailer who ignored Amazon. Right? You guys don't remember, but Amazon sold book, physical books online, right? Nobody thinks of them that way anymore. They think of them as an online retailer. So the ability to use this and change yourself, even if it's on the edges, in, an, in a big company, you always have to look at who's coming at the edges. And then you've got to figure out what's your strategy. Because if you're not at the edge looking at it, those are your competitors. Your traditional competitors are usually not going to be your future competitors. In 1980, the big competitor for GE was Westinghouse. Westinghouse doesn't even exist. So we don't even think about them anymore. So the fact is you've got to look at who's on the edges, who's getting your markets, what's changing, big or small, and you've got to think, oh, what does it mean to you? And why a lot of companies feel is they don't see themselves in this. And most companies, by the way, today don't analyze their data. And so this is a great opportunity either for a small company or a big company. This is probably the biggest opportunity and why it's talked about so much. The second thing that we saw is, and, and we looked and said, you know, Let's look at what happened in the past decade with the Internet. And if you looked at the Internet back in 1995, 96, and you were really smart, you'd say, a billion people are going to get connected. What are they going to do, and how is that going to change business? Now, if you did that, you know, you would be, you know, the, 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 the person running Amazon today. Now, the thing is that people like Jeff Bezos have said, when a billion people get connected, I'm going to be... The, the biggest retailer in the world, at that point in time, become big. One, one thing I learned from, I remember John Chambers at Cisco, you say this, and he'd say, by the time it's obvious, it's too late. It's a famous saying, and that's true. Why don't all of you go off and be entrepreneurs, create retail websites, and be Amazon? Because it's too late. So you've got to, whether it's small or big, you've got to think about timing. Timing's everything. So back in 95, 96, lots of people had the opportunity to say, uh-oh, a billion people are getting connected on the Internet. Somebody's going to make money here. Somebody's going to transform an industry. And just think about entertainment, social uh, media, social marketing, comms, uh, the way IT has been virtualized, retail, and ad. All these industries have been foundationally changed. So think about this. You know, where do you buy your music and your books? It's not who you bought them from in 1995. Borders would tell you they wish. Who did Borders give their, their online book business to? Amazon. They basically gave it away because they didn't think there was any money to be made by electronic books. Why? They asked their customers and their customers said, I don't ever want to read an electronic book. It's too bulky. It's too hard to buy. What did Jeff Bezos say? He said, oh, it's too bulky. It's too, let me give him something nice, easy, and I'll transform the world. So you begin to look at entertainment being digitized. People who figured it out, one, social, nobody thought social media and social market was worth anything. You know, Facebook emerged. Um, think of VMware. VMware was all about how, you'd, uh, how you began to virtualize your environment. What they did is they said, you know, Everybody doesn't get enough out of their storage or out of their PCs, and I'm going to figure out how to get more out of it. It was a very simple model. So my point is anybody could figure these out if you could figure out what the big transformation is and then imagine the industry and what you would do to go in that industry and take it and essentially take it away from somebody else. What, what changed for us and the way we think about this is we're at a point like 95, 96, when everybody talks about the Internet of Things. And as nobody probably here thinks, well, how am I going to make money on the Internet of Things? Or maybe every day you're thinking about it. I know I think about it, but I think about it differently. I said, when 50 billion machines get connected, what the heck does that mean? Who's going to make money? Who's not going to make money? How are they going to change how they make money? You've got to ask yourself that. Because I'm going to tell you, in 10 years, everybody says 50 billion machines get connected. It doesn't matter whether the big beer spigot gets connected. What does matter is, can you change the beer market because of it? I'm not suggesting that's the best idea in the world, but it may be. You've got to figure it out. I will tell you this. When you start to look at this, how operational technology works is going to be virtualized. Analytics will be used to predict things before, they have, before something breaks. If you want to know the biggest 
opportunity in the world is predictive maintenance. If I can tell you something's going to break before it breaks and you can fix it in a standard maintenance procedure, you can save a ton of money. Think about airlines. Every time you get on a plane and the plane gets delayed because the captain comes on and says the check engine light's on, you know, you get unhappy, you might get delayed, you might get canceled. It's no fun for anybody. But if I could fix that before it came on, if I could do that magic, that would change that market. So when we look at it, we think about all of this and what are the possibilities. And I'm trying to force GE to reimagine what happens when machines get connected because we are in the big machine business. And if somebody else figures out how to build businesses and services around machines and does it better than us, where's our profit? In services. Where do we want to be? Services. So we have to be at the edge of rethinking how we provide services about machines because this change is coming. And I will tell you, this is the biggest opportunity in the next decade. And winners and losers, we don't know. But some set of people are going to go in industries and figure out how to transform them by taking this change and figure out what the new opportunity is. And either entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial companies are going to make this happen. So part of what we've been working on is this change. What does it mean? What should we be doing? That's what big companies often don't do, by the way. That's good for small companies a lot of times. The third big change is it's not about the data. There's no money to be made in the data. But data is like a boat anchor. You need analytics. The real thing is what does all this data mean? What can you learn from the data? What new insight can you deliver that delivers an entirely new outcome to a process? Now, that is hard. Remember pre predictive maintenance? Can I figure out when a part's going to break 10 flights before it breaks? That's like magic, right? But if I can, that's worth a ton of money. So if I can do that, that's great. But the magic is do I have the data? Can I do the an analytics? And then can I deliver the insight? There is money to be made in how you figure this out in any industry you're served. But the question is, which industry, where, how, that's a big part of what it takes to win in the market. And the la I, I would think one last thing that's changing is you've got to figure out how you deliver this. Now this, to you guys, may seem like a no-brainer, but it's amazing to me to watch that a lot of people take, and they may get all the rest of it right, they get the technology wrong. And the technology matters. So think about you know, the AOL, and it was a dial-up service, and it was the best service in the market. And why isn't AOL the best service today? They own the internet. It's because the technology they were focused on was dial-up, and they ignored the internet, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they missed the technology even though they had the solution. And there is a technology shift that's going on right now from client server to consumer grade that's a, that parallels what happened with the mainframe that really gets down to the idea of the cloud and, and how cloud software gets built, how you manage big data, mobile, PCs sort of gone, the idea of machines becoming intelligent, how you build a really compelling user experience and security. People who can master all that to deliver their product or service are going to win. But if you deliver it on the old technology, you're not going to win. So it's complicated to really think about how are you going to change a business? What are you going to offer? And if you get any one of the things I just talked about wrong, you won't win in the market. So for me, I've spent a lot of time with GE trying to educate them on these things that are going on because nat it's not natural to someone who thinks about how you build a locomotive or a uh, gas turbine or a wind turbine to think about this stuff. But that's what you do in bigger companies is you've got to get them to shift and innovate from the old to the new. And that's what I've spent the last three years doing. And I'm fortunate in that you know we've got amazing executives there. And I've been able to, to show them the data. And what has happened is that uh, this has become one of the top three initiatives in the company. So if you read our annual report, you'll find out we're investing, and I've convinced the company to invest a billion and a half dollars over four years in this. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about the results. So I don't care whether you're an entrepreneur, small company, or an intrapreneur.
big company, you've got to get this right. You've got to convince either your investors that you got the right, all, all of this together, right? The VCs, and I've done that. Or you've got to convince your senior management you got these right, and, the, and it's compelling. And in the end, I really believe this is compelling. Now, I'll, I want to talk to you about then, you've got to translate that into how you make money. Whether big company or small company, how you make money is really at the center of things. And you've got to figure out what you're going to be good at and what you're not going to be good at. And this is hard. Sometimes people want to boil the ocean. They want to do everything. Especially in a big company, focus is often the hardest thing to do. But when we look at it, we focus on saying, look, there's just three things we want to do. We want to make our machine smarter, get more data, get the right data, and be the best at that. We want to be the best at the analytics on that data. And then we want to be the best at delivering this to someone who's on an oil rig or in a locomotive and change how they work. And those are the things we're focused on. We're not going to build new devices. We're not going to build mobile devices. We're going, to, we're going to work in certain other areas. So figuring out what you're going to focus and not focus on, this is really a hard thing for almost anyone in an entrepreneurial company. It is what we are focusing on, yes. <laughs> is there a way, how do small companies outside of GE, maybe you're going to hit this, how do small companies outside of GE contribute or collaborate with you for the things that you're doing? Yeah, yeah you know, I get, uh, I'll bet you I get contacted by 30 to 50 companies a week, small and big. Mm -hmm. um, and I bet you I respond to two, maybe one. Um, and, and so the best way is the ones I'm going to respond with are through relationships. The, the thing is that you know, you've, got to, you, you've got to find a relationship, a trusted relationship into a big company. That's the hardest part. The other way is we do go to conferences. We look, if you can capture the attention because you've, worked, you've got enough of a product to show, you know, that's, that's another way. But the reality is for every... I'll guarantee there's 10 companies, little companies, building anything new at one time that are competing. The problem is how do you decide which one you're going to bet on? And, um, and so in the end, the best way is you've got to figure, you got to you know, sort of take the first derivative. You want to go find the right relationship to get into. Best way, use your board. Use your venture capitalists. We had, our, the venture capitalists are always coming to us with ideas and saying, here's someone I'd work with. Trying to sell it on your own with no tie, then you're, 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 you have one hope, and that's luck. And so these are the ways, okay? We are focused on two things we think have big money. Strive for zero unscheduled downtime. If I can fix something on an airplane before it breaks, it's probably worth 90000 every time to an airline. Okay, so I just got to find... 100 of those a year across an entire fleet and save them a significant amount of money. A 1% one, 1 of all the, if I can give 1% fuel efficiency to the airline industry, that's worth $3 billion a year. So they'll eagerly share some of that with you. So the idea of a 1% gain in these things is not outlandish, and that's what we are striving for. And anything we can do to help them operationally optimize. Bed management. We've helped in, because we're in healthcare, 10% uh, bed utilization, which just comes down to better scheduling of beds and helping a nurse decide what's the optimal way to, to assign a bed. I thought that was easy, but then you find out, well, if you're a heart patient, you need a certain kind of bed with a certain kind of nurse with a certain kind of equipment. If you're an oncology patient, it's totally different. If you're someone that broke your leg, it's, you're totally different. And if you put the wrong person in the wrong bed, you've just lost that bed and that equipment, and, uh, and now suddenly you have people waiting. So the idea of, of operational optimization is huge. We, we see this um, uh, idea of 1% productivity can easily save $20 billion a year. We did an analysis, which we did the first one, and now there's been seven or eight that say 
This idea of just focusing on the industrial economy, I'll show you, is a $500 billion a year business. It's the largest opportunity that exists today. Now, then I had to sit down and try to convince the company what to do. The hardest thing is changing a big t company. So partly, I've had to work with the company and say, okay, if we're going to go capture this, we've got to change our organization. We've got to change our architecture. We've got to change our ecosystem. Three things we've got to change. I say this to you because when you're working in a big company versus a small, the beauty of when I was in a small company, every day I got up, I was the master of the universe. When I made a decision, I can get everybody to make a decision together. We can do it in 15 minutes. When you work in a big company, you're, you're, it's hopeless to make a decision across everybody. And how do you construct and do this is totally different. But it's a heck of a lot of fun, I have to tell you. I, uh, and the one nice thing about a big company, customers love buying from big companies. So you get it right, it's a heck of a lot more fun, than, and it's a different set of problems. I don't worry every day about you know, finding one more customer. Okay, I know how to get the customer if i got the right product. Whereas a small company, you're worried about how to build, how to grow, how to compete, how to make sure you have enough capital. I don't worry about that. I got pl I, plenty, you never have enough money, by the way, but I have plenty of capital, right? The fact is that, you know, when, I got, when, when we stand up and say we invest a billion and a half dollars, that's a pretty meaningful statement. You ha it's hard to do that in a startup. I can change the world in a big company. A small company, one out of 100,000 changes the world. So if Facebook changes the world, but there's a lot of startups that never get there. So the reason I went to a big company is I've been in the small company. I've done that. It's self-fulfilling it, it, you know, for me. I made, made a few dollars. I felt good about it. I've mastered my own tiny little pond. This is about changing the world. And the reason you go to a big company to go do this, and not everybody in a big company is an entrepreneur. Very few people are. I happen, this is my thing. It's a lot of fun. I like the idea of changing the world. Now, the other thing I'll just tell you is uh, when we came in here, a lot of people, we put this in Silicon Valley, and a lot of people said, you can't be successful in Silicon Valley. And um, interestingly enough, I, I started two years ago, there was two of us, me and my assistant. And uh, so we've hired 800 people. We've hired them from big companies and small companies and, and from uh, directly out of the university and so on. So, you know, I think that, I was faced with a lot of challenges where people said, oh, you'll never hire me. Nobody wants to do this. But you just got to figure out the right people. For us, it's not about hiring people who are entrepreneurs. It's intrapreneurs. And we actually look at that. And the difference is we ask one simple question. You know, when you say you want to change the world, what do you want to do? And a lot of people think, I want to go build a game or social networking or, you know, work for a cool company. And that's, that's what you should go do. For us, if they say, look, I want to go really make a difference in healthcare, or I think energy is the coolest thing, and I want to, sh I want to change the energy market, then that's what we do. So you got to figure out the right kind of people, and you got to bring them in. The only, and, and so you can, you know, it's just a different set of problems in a big company versus a small company, but you can do it. you just got to figure out how to do it. I'd say a couple of final things. I work across all of these GE businesses. The coolest thing I, I've seen... You know, them shoot a uh, turkey through a jet aircraft engine to test it. Kind of a cool thing. Not a live turkey, just to be clear. Uh, I've, I've been on a locomotive, came right off the line, brand new Canadian Pacific locomotive. It was fun. I got to drive it down the test track for two miles, you know. And uh, so working with big machines is, I'm sort of at a point, I love, I love things. I love to see how an, uh, an, a... Uh, you know, and a CT scanner is made. If you've ever seen it, you know, it looks like a big donut. Take the hood off. It's basically a jet aircraft engine with a camera, and it goes really fast. Scares the heck out of you to see it running like that, but that's essentially what it is. It's just a camera that's spinning extraordinarily fast. The reason GE's in that business is we took the same people who designed jet aircraft engines. We don't do thrust. We make it spin fast. So lots of interesting things that we get to work on. Been to a wind farm been to an oil rig. So that's the kind of things we do. What we're trying to tell these guys is, look, everything's about architecture. Build a platform. The one thing, if you're going to go be a leader in industry, build your platform. Every great company has built a platform. Secondly, then, is we deliver solutions on that platform. And platform's important. I can't spend a lot of time on that. But for us, it's about being machine-centric. 
It's about machine to machine connectivity where we are putting intelligence directly in the machine. What makes this different than the consumer world is how much logic we put in the machine, how much processing, why it's got to be real time. It's a totally different world than the consumer guys who think I got to have that all go into the cloud. If it all goes into the cloud and that jet aircraft is running, you don't want it to sit there and wait and uh, say, oops, wait, I didn't get an answer. Uh, I think it'll shut off, right? So it's, it's got to have an answer right away on what to do. So this idea of machine to machine is changing everything in the world. And I think this and how products get built, a la look at Nest, right? You know, Google paid $3.2 billion for a thermostat and a fire alarm that happens to talk on the Internet. Why? Because they really believe the 100 people working there are the greatest designers of consumer products in the machine to machine space. That's why. They didn't get the, re there was no revenues. I'm pretty sure a lot of people can go build a thermostat. You can buy lots of others. What they were buying was the designers. And whoever can figure out how to design great products here, they're going to be the winners. Analytics for us is important in there. Being on the cloud and making that resilient and secure. The communication is everything. How you secure communication. Now, I know other people, we, and uh, Ikalak and I were talking, other people come and say, well, the advertising system we already have in the world will work to do resilient and secure machine-to-machine -machine -communic connectivity. I don't know how many of you used your smartphone when it doesn't always work. It can't, you know, you, 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 know, you get upset when your smartphone doesn't work. We're in the electrical power generation. We generate 40% of the world's electricity. When your electricity goes out, it's a totally different experience of anger than when your phone doesn't work. And we know that. You, people just expect electricity to work. So you cannot have the same sort of environment. So these are the things we think of as really important to a machine to machine environment. And we're looking at building that platform for the industrial world. I'm really proud. I just, this is my, my, my you know, page to say I'm proud because everything from uh, Wired Magazine to Bank of America have said this is the uh, next generation. So this is my. I'd really like to read these to you, but Iklak said I can't. Um, look, I think uh, when you look at this market, just to give you a feel for this, Bank of America said the global industrial activity is 32 trillion. One to two efficiency gain is 320 to 640 billion. Software and systems are going to monetize 30 to 50 percent of that for a savings of 100 to 300 billion. The market opportunity today, before it grows, today is 50 to 160 billion. How many people know of a market that big today that's unserved, unaddressed? And that's why this is interesting. What I love is they basically said, look, you're either going to have, you've got to have domain experience around the industry you serve. You've got to have the, the technical capability. Here's the companies of technical capability. Here's the industries that have domain experience. And, you know, we've somehow convinced them that we belong up there uh, as the only one that is focusing on it today. So part of being an entrepreneur is taking this to market, helping to develop the market, getting others to see the opportunity, and others to believe and demonstrate that you can do it. And that is the same thing whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. But as a big company, no one gives credibility to a big company to be innovative. The ability to do that is a different, kind, a different skill set. And these are things to think about. For me, you know, just I, I leave you with, and then I'll turn over to questions. I just want to give you a couple of things about my journey because when I graduated, I had a, a bachelor's and a master's in computer science, and I was going to be a researcher. In fact, I started my career at IBM's Los Angeles Scientific Center, and I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life, is I was going to do research, and I'm sort of a infrastructure, all the behind the scenes. In those days, we cared about things like compilers, and, and that was a big area, and operating systems, and so on. That was my thing. I thought, this is the next 30 years. I'm going to be in research. I'll do high technology. And since then, uh, you know, I probably have been a lost soul, maybe, some people would say. I started at IBM, and I went over to a company that's in the government-oriented research called MITRE, and that started me working with the government, I started moving into being a business person. I thought about, suddenly I found I was much more interested in how 
I'm moving away from research and moving into running big programs. I then created a couple of companies and uh, was involved in taking a couple public. And I found I'd suddenly changed from being that to being the CTO of companies that I was going public. And that was fun and that was interesting, but I found um, that I reached a point in that that I wanted to do something bigger. And I always felt that you, there's plenty of ways to make money. So moving into GE, uh, and f first to Cisco, and then the GE was about going to big companies and trying to make change, and trying to make change in a major way. Um, when I think about this, and I think that you know, for a lot of you who are in this program, you know, the, I, I think one thing that I've learned, I, you probably all know what you want to be for the next 30 years. You probably know exactly what you're going to do for the next 30 years. I would just say one thing, I just give you some things to think about from my perspective about what does it mean whether you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur and, and that I've learned. So if I had this told me 30 years ago, I'd have ignored it too. But um, these are the things I would have loved to tell myself. And if you, let's see, Clayton Christian. How many people know Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Okay, th well, good. Okay, so a bunch of engineers in here. So you know, the fact is that, you know, once you observe things, <laughs> it, 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 has, it changes it, right? And, and you know, the, uh, it's not a perfect match, but it does mean as you begin to look and do what you think you're going to do, it's sometimes a lot different than you think. I think this program is fantastic, and I love being part of the advisory board because you get to hopefully see this. But I think this, it really is important to begin to dig down and know what you are and what you're good at. And um, you know, I was, a, a, I was technology oriented, research, high end building systems. That was what I thought I was gonna do forever. And the fact is, I think I got early uh, leadership guidance about flexibility and dealing with ambiguity. And, and why that was important is that you never know what it's going to take to win either in what you're doing, i.e., you may think you know your product, but the whole idea in the Valley now is minimally viable product and pivoting. In other words, it's uncertain. Whatever you build is probably wrong. Once a customer observes it, it's probably not as successful as you think, and you better be up to make changes quickly. And the whole Valley experience is about speed. If you aren't fast, you can't win. Well, it's the same is actually true in many cases of your career. It's figuring out as you go through it what you're good at. I have, uh, in every review I've gotten, and I, I just went through an executive review at GE, it is like a, uh, you know, like a three-day physical up at the Mayo Clinic. I mean, they explore every aspect of your life, and they come back and they tell you what you're good at, what you're not good at, and uh, it's part of the executive experience at GE. And what, one thing I found that I always know is, that uh, operation, I get bored with the operational side of things. So I've, uh, I'm really bored, you know. And um, it's not that I don't care about it. I go do it. But I'm more interested in getting out and creating new, new products. I'm more interested in how I change what's going on. I'm more interested in customers. So you've got to figure out either you're going to have someone there operationally with you or you're going to figure out that you probably shouldn't be doing that or... Make sure your job is surrounded by what you do and what you want to do. The, the most important thing, however, I learned was if I'm going to do, figure out what I'm not good at and hire the best people in the world and make them who are much better and smarter than I am to do the things I hate. And, and so a lot of people don't go through. I've seen a lot of people f struggle in this because they either try to do it all and they don't know what they don't like. And by the way, if you ask yourselves, you probably don't know. You know what you don't want to spend your time on. So hire the best people to do what you're not good at. This idea of unexpected consequences is, uh, you know, as you look at it, the earlier you figure out what you really want to do and make sure you're going to go after that in a major way or be open to the change. Now, with me, I have to say I was successful at every one of those and I made a conscious career decision to change because as I got really good at being a researcher, I realized... Now, that's not as exciting as really going and making money and developing new products. And as I develop new products, I go, well, that's not as much fun as building a really big business and changing the world. So those are things I think about. 
Be comfortable with ambiguity. If there's anything, it doesn't matter, big or small. If you're an entrepreneur, if you are not comfortable with ambiguity, you will find it very difficult to operate. You've got to be comfortable with that ambiguity. And that is uh, probably the most important thing. Now, it turns out in my assessment, I am so comfortable with ambiguity, I like it. Now, I don't know why, but I like I'm okay with things not being clear. I'm okay with organizations not being fully uh, uh, and there's a lot of people working with me, they just want everything organized and kept the same forever. And I'm okay with changing tomorrow. But that's the thing you've got to figure out. Because if you're not good with ambiguity, you can't make the changes necessary to be in an entrepreneurial environment. And that, I would say, is what I learned. And then knowing who you really are. I, the one thing that is consistent in my life and in the review, this review of the sun is I really love the next big thing. didn't matter whether I was building it technically, building a product, or building a whole new business, that's what I cared about. And for me, at least, I learned that one thing early on, and I never, when I went and looked, the opportunities came my way, I always began to think about, does it fit my style of doing things? So, you know, I, hopefully, and we'll, you know, I'll open up for questions, but hopefully, you know, you can see what we're doing at GE, what we think is the next big thing. There's a lot of money to be made, not just by us, by lots of people in this area. This is what they mean by big data and IoT, in my personal opinion. And these are the things I would think about to figure out, what do you go from here? What are you going to do when you leave this? How, do, how is it going to impact you? So with that, let me open up for questions, and I'll answer anything you might be interested in. I think it's on. Yeah. Um, uh, the main question I had was uh, this this uh, juxtaposition of being comfortable with ambiguity, but at the same time being willing to make changes. So um, if you're too comfortable with ambiguity, don't you need to like, necessarily like, strive to understand the problem and uh, necessarily address it? So how do you balance that? Yeah, so one is, is you have to learn focus really quickly. And so with, with, what I mean by ambiguity is you do not have to know the answer to everything to ship out a, to ship a, a product. In fact, if you look at the concept of the lean startup, is you're going to build a minimally viable product and then go and you're very quickly going to make changes. The ambiguity is I don't have the right product, but I'm willing to change. So I think ambiguity and change actually go along. The one thing I have to say is focus. If you don't have focus and you're comfortable with ambiguity, you're a basket case, right? Because you'll do every, you, you won't have, you'll do everything and accomplish nothing. And I think your question is really insightful because the idea of how you accomplish something is really at the, is at the end goal, right? So you have to be good at knowing, I'm going to accomplish this. My end goal is to create the best widget or service in the market, but I'm going to be comfortable not having the full organization. I'm going to be comfortable knowing I don't know exactly how we're going to solve this problem, but it's not the most important problem today. I'll be okay with it. And uh, some people try to boil the ocean. They try to resolve everything up front, create the perfect organization, and perfect is the enemy of good. So those are the things I would say. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, thank you. Um, your talk really reminded me about the book I read, Little Bets, and I was wondering, it argues that big companies fail to innovate because they care too much on ROI and not too much on, and they should be looking at what can I afford to lose. Yep. So do you think that's the case, that they think too much on return on investments? Absolutely. I deal with this all the time. Uh, you know, when I, my first year, it was like, uh, what value did you deliver? Because big companies focus quarter to quarter, and in our businesses, they just think quarter to quarter, and they're not, the people there are not like me. But they're good at delivering that quarter to quarter capability. But the problem is, you have to be very strong, whether you're an entrepreneur or an intrapreneur, and especially in a big company, you've got to be, you've got to be willing to have enough calluses that when people are throwing darts at you, the self-confidence is, hey, buddy, I know that, you know, if, if, if you were in Borders, hey, buddy, I know if we don't go into this electronic book business, you, we're out of business. And every day, I have to be confident enough to do that. The second thing is you've got to focus, and you can't let them distract you in an ROI. The last thing is you have to 
balance out. They don't give me a billion and a half dollars on day one and say, Bill, go have a big party, you know, come back and tell us what you did. You know, you've got to show milestones and, and milestones are important, but not every milestone has to be, I delivered, you know, 100 million revenue. My first year, I did a diagnostic. What did I do? I looked at where they were and I told them why they were going to miss the boat. What, what they were doing wasn't working. Now, you could imagine I was really popular that first year. So not only did they say, what did you deliver? They said, and you complain about us all the time. But I wasn't complaining. I was trying to show them where we weren't going down the right path. The second year is about creating a strategy. Now, this isn't at internet speed, but it was okay because we're only, it was about creating a strategy and telling them this is a strategy. They liked the strategy because they, they couldn't argue with the charts, but they would all say, okay, Bill's good at strategy, but does he know how to execute? The third year, which was this year, we developed 24 and launched 24 new applications, these predictivity applications on Predix, and we sold $880 million of new service, net new services in the first year. That was not thought possible. And next year, we got a big number. And so we created a fairly large business in that period of time with those businesses. That is, is you've got to have the confidence, because if in first year I got nervous, I didn't have the confidence, I would never have got, had the courage to go through that. And the last thing is you've got to have organization that supports you and milestones. And as long as you continue to move through those milestones, you'll be okay. But this is a confidence game. And by the way, that's true of running your startup, because I'll guarantee, having been in there, the vulture cap, I mean, venture capitals list at your board, they, uh, and for those who want to be the vulture capitalists, you know, you'll come in, and you think you're smarter than the entrepreneur. You're going to tell them how I've done, I got 40 companies, and sometimes you have to listen to them. Sometimes you have to have the confidence to stand up to them. Because if you listen to everything they have to say, you will find that company's not nearly as successful. And that doesn't mean you don't listen to them. You've got to listen to them just enough to pull, the, to pull the real knowledge out, but you have to have the confidence enough. And this is what I see lots of people fail on, is self-doubt or they get attacked and they can't take it. And you're going to be attacked in a big company or small company in different ways, but you've got to have the confidence to live up to your objectives. That's why I think. So, next question. Hi, so you mentioned that um, you first have to have a good idea and then you need to convince people that it's a good idea. So have you ever ran into a situation in which people just weren't convinced and how did you approach that? Yes, a thousand of them. I have so many good ideas nobody listens to, it's unbelievable. But <laughs> look, I think, um, yeah, you know, especially, there's a couple of things I learned, you know, uh, when I left IBM, I went to the Mitre Corporation. I moved up the Mitre Corporation as fast as anybody or faster than anybody had ever done. So I had grown into the executive ranks in about a, a, a seven, eight-year period. And, um, uh, and the, uh, what I found there, and I, I probably could have stayed and I would have been a high potential, which you know, meant I could have run it one day. would have been exciting. But um, what I found... Uh, is that I had ideas about what needed to be done and I felt that it was too slow moving. So one is you got to make a decision. Are you in the environment that you want to be in to accomplish that goal? Do you think you can accomplish it and how important? Because what became important to me was this was right when the internet was coming out. I really believed we needed to go into this and uh, Interestingly enough, when I felt it couldn't be done that way, the one person I convinced and was engaged with was the CEO of MITRE, and we ended up leaving MITRE and creating a startup. So, but the company was not convinced. So sometimes you may find you have to make a very hard decision that, that you just can't get there, and it's time for you to go someplace else. Knowing when that is, and knowing sometimes you just, you have to re-strategize and change your path. That's the hard part. And for me, I made so many mistakes early on. But the thing I learned in those early days is that people often in, who were decision makers, they looked at you as too young. I know. They looked at me and said, well, he's too young, right? And I felt that. You will feel that earlier. The older you get, the easier sometimes that they get new problems. But in those days, I found that was the thing that, that frustrated me the most the first 10 years of my career, is that there was 
trying to convince people. And a lot of times it was your age that got in the way of these people making a decision. Well, you don't have enough experience. We've done this before. And I leave you with one final thought there. And if you haven't heard, there's this idea of crab management. And this is what you've got to always decide. When you get in a big company or a small company and they aren't listening to you, it's the reason is most of these companies are like a bucket of crabs. And if you've seen a bucket of crabs, they never put a cover on a bucket of crabs. And you wonder why don't they crawl out? Because they're all trying to get out. And almost all of them get up there. And the reason is if you look at a bucket of crabs, as they're crawling out and they're just about to get out, the rest of the crabs reach up and pull them back in and says, that isn't going to work. We did that before. That's a dumb idea. You're going to get that. And, and that's why you have to decide, are you in the right bucket or not? And if you're in the right bucket, then you just got to find a different path to crawl over them and just be faster than them. And the final thing is sometimes I, ask, I learned to ask for uh, forgiveness rather than permission, and it was always better except for once in a while. <laughs> okay? Hi. Um, so could you explain a little bit more how the industrial excuse me, Internet differs from the Internet of Things, or if it does? Yeah, it does. Um, so the Internet of Things is sort of undefined in many ways. It's the idea that machines will get connected. Beyond that, there really is no definition of it, uh, and you have multitude. For us, we looked and said, okay, machines are going to get connected. We're all in Internet of Things. Inter from an industrial Internet, what we're saying is, is quite different. We're saying, look, the consumer Internet, it's that charter show. Consumer Internet was about a billion people getting connected. The industrial internet is about 50 billion people get connected. It wasn't about the people getting connected that made the consumer internet interesting. It was that it enabled all this transformation in businesses that nobody thought of. Same is true of the industrial internet. 50 billion, 50 billion machines or the internet of things is going to happen. That's not what we care about. What we care about is, okay, what's gonna, what does that mean to transforming industries? And that's where we're focused. So when we talk about the industrial internet, we're actually focused on not the connectivity, but the idea that the connectivity enables us to develop new business models and new services no one ever thought of before, and that's what it means. And so it's really this, it's the idea of a consumer internet was the last decade, the industrial internet's the next decade. One was driven by people getting connected, one is driven by machines getting connected. And the meaning is change of business, change of services, opportunity, opportunity, opportunity to go make money. That's what it is. So a lot of people talk about the emotional roller coaster of an entrepreneur, or even even entrepreneurs. So I wanted to ask you, like, if you don't mind, could you talk about one of your low points, and then how did you get through it? So um, okay, I'll open up to you on this one. <laughs> um, so I, you know, you always have up and down low points. I'll tell you the biggest low point, and probably uh, you know, is a lesson learned. Um, so when I had my startup. You know, you bring in venture capital and they own a lot of the company. If you look at, you know, you know Mark Zuckerberg, he, own, he owns that company. He makes every decision. I admire how he structured the company. I didn't, I learned, I structured it wrong. And so the venture capitalists had the controlling decision. So I'll give you the, the, my moment when I was the deepest, darkest was uh, as it had gone on, I, um, I, uh, they decided they wanted a different, my friend was the CEO of the company, I was the CTO. They wanted a different CEO and different CFO, and they brought in somebody so we could go public. This was a, uh, it was right uh, in two, uh, 1999, we were going to go public in 2000. Uh, it, that was when you had this downturn. We were ready to go public, it was really interesting time, to, you know, so I, I went from the highest high, but during that I discovered that I, I felt that the CEO and CFO lacked integrity. And they had uh, got some sweetheart deals, and I was a founder I was unaware of and not available to me when they went public. And that's a long story what it was, but just put it in that context. The second thing is, so I was really low, but I thought, okay, I'm going to be really rich. I'm not going to worry about it. Then we don't go public. So now I find out they got something I thought was a sweetheart deal, lack of integrity, and by that I thought they were kind of jerks. And you don't want to be in that environment. Now I ended up leaving there to go to a great company called the Advisory Board who recruited me to be their CTO and they eventually went public. But 
uh, during that time was very low. I went to the board because I felt they were managing the company wrong. I went to the board and it was my most courageous moment in life and I sat up in front of the board and I laid out why I thought we were going down the wrong path and why I thought they were taking us down the wrong path. And the venture capitalists said, we're going to back them. They control the company. And I went off and did my thing. Now, I had all my stock and everything. The, you know, the, the, the end of that story is three months later, they, uh, they ended up firing both of them for integrity problems. So you feel vindicated, but at that moment in time, you know, I had to stand up for what I believe was right and go after it. And it was a low of low because I'd founded the company. This was like my baby. But you've got to sometimes do what's right. And I sold my stock. They eventually sold the company. And, uh, you know, it was okay. But the fact is that you will find there are times where you don't know what you've got to do. I felt I had a stamp, and it didn't work out as I thought, but it turned out I was right. So what do you do? But that was the deepest, darkest moment of probably my professional career. And it all came down to, do you trust the people you work with? And the one thing I've learned is I pick jobs based on the integrity and quality of the people I get to work with. Because at the end of the day, nothing else matters. You'll be miserable otherwise. Yep. And don't tell that story too often. That's my, so now you know my neuroses. Hi. So you talked about having confidence in the initial first year. Yeah. And I'm sure like even in your startup, in the first first part of it, you had to have a lot of belief and be confident of what you're doing. Yeah. So do you think that's a personality trait you had, or how did you develop that confidence <laughs> to like just stick through it? You know, uh, that was a learned behavior. I mean, um, I, I think that you have, you know, I had a certain level of confidence when I was younger, but I was a computer science programmer, technologist, systems guy, right? And uh, But I certainly, you know, I never had confidence in areas I hadn't experienced. And again, when I was younger, I always found that being young seemed to be like a detriment. I was like, so I, you know, I always think about that when I manage people now. But, in the, you know, so I have to say that left me a little bit feeling like, do I have enough confidence? I, uh, it wasn't until I got to the startup that I developed the confidence to stand up. It led to this final pretty you know, you got to stand up, you got to put yourself on the line, you got to decide what you're going to do, and you live with the results. And I think what, what I learned through that process is to stand back and look through the results and don't have a fear. As long as you're doing what's right and you do it with integrity and you stand up, you're okay. Now, the, there are some things out of your control and it may be time to leave, and then you just better be prepared to deal with the consequences of that. But the ability to have confidence, that's one. Number two is, I will tell you, I was the most nervous, worst speaker you could imagine 30 years ago. Now, you may look and go, he still is. But the fact is, I couldn't sit in front of three people, never mind, uh, you know, and I now feel very confident talking in front of groups of 10,000 people. And um, if I give you one piece of wisdom is, the more you learn how to communicate in a group, the more you learn how to establish a message, the more you can connect and you're honest with them. The, you know, that's how you win a lot of this confidence, and that's how you, confidence battles, and that's how you win a lot of battles. So the most important thing for me is being able to uh, communicate and communicate effectively, and that's how you both have confidence, and that's how you convince people what you're going to do. And I, you will find in your life that you'll go to meetings, you'll go, that guy has no content, is, is com, you know, completely incompetent, but somehow they get what they want. And it's because a lot of times the people who can carry the day are the best speakers and are, are confident in delivering that. And you know, the final thing I'll tell you is, is a lot of times I'm not confident in delivering it because you wonder what... Does everybody think? What are the? But you just have to, you just have to go in and portray confidence, you know. And uh, that's the most important thing. Okay. Um, Bill, so um, I know that there's still a number of questions queued up, but I'm gonna just 
I'm going to suggest that they come down and talk to you just after because I want to take the last question. And I actually want to give you one slightly tough question to... <laughs> to oh, these uh, are the easy warm-up questions? Th those are warm-up. Um, it, it's not that bad, but um, what I want to um, have you um, address is, first of all, I'm assuming that GE probably is hiring. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. And, um, and so um, in your own career, you started off with small companies, and eventually you've come to large companies. So, well, I started with IBM. They were kind of a big company back th then. That's true, but um, you, you've been. I through, moved from big to medium to small, and then back up. Right. The, I did and, a V. And okay, and now you're you're in the big. So on one hand, you've got an interest to hire people, and so yeah. you would say, you know, you should think about yeah. GE and so forth. And on the other hand, you yourself have been in small companies. I'm sure you had great experiences. Yeah. There. So. What is your real recommendation to, um, to them in terms of what they should do starting off in their career? Yeah, I, I think that there's, uh, the first thing is, I think you do have to know yourself. You have to know, do you have the confidence? Do you have the idea? Do you know yourself enough to know your weaknesses? And are you willing to find people to work around you who are better than you at things you're not good at? Because if you feel the need to be in control of everything, that's the hardest thing. Right? Can you attract talent? And so you really have to know that. If you feel you got that, I think that you know, being in a small company, you'll, there's plenty, it, it always interests me how much money there is out there. Now, with that said, you, you are going to work you know, 22 hours a day, and the other two, you know, you'll pay your bills and eat. Right? So you did, in working in a small company, you, there's just a pace and a drive you have to have. And if you don't have that, you, it's not an eight-hour day. So that's number one. Number two, I think, is that I think for a big company, you go in and you say, I want to learn, and there's certain things. So the reason people come to GE is to learn an industry, get leadership training, and become a high potential. Now, not everybody is a high potential in any company. But if you go into and you get into the, you know, that at a big company, and just look at you know our CEO Jeff or our prior CEO Jack Welsh. I mean their histories is uh, uh, both of them started I think someplace I know Jeff was at P and G I believe. But they got in and then they worked themselves because they wanted to lead big companies. And that is something you can go do. You can be an entrepreneur and lead big companies. So you have to decide: Are you willing to go on that journey? Because it's a journey of patience a bit in a big company. That doesn't mean patience meaning you know, uh, a year. But you're going to have to have patience. You're going to have to find the right place. So um, if you find that, that I'd say you look at that. The final thing is, you know, I think you got to be open to figure out um, uh, to change. So it's okay to make a mistake. And that would be the final thing is try what you, you know, I've made, I've been, I would never have guessed. You know, early in my career I thought, I'll work for three companies. Why? I don't know. But somehow I thought that was right. I, you know, and I worked for seven. Never would have thought that. But the fact is, I was open to change, and it's okay to change and grow and go after what you want. So your strategy could be go to a big company, work there two years, get a little exper expertise, meet some people. And by the way, I just had somebody leave and go to a small company, a startup. I've had a couple people. Some come back and some don't. And I, so I think that it's knowing yourself, Try things out. Be willing to change. But if you have a great idea, I'd go do a startup. Fail now. Fail early. Fail often. Because you're smart enough, you're going to go find a thousand other places. You'll be very valuable. And don't ever forget that. That's my guidance. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I am going to have to leave. So I won't. I'll have a, like a few minutes to hang out, but not, okay. not a whole lot. Yeah, I know I cut off some questions. So if, if you want to, come oh, on down. Email. Let me just say, my email, if you want to send me an email, if you are interested, is simply ru, R-U-H, at ge.com. Okay. So. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. And thank you again. Thank All you. Right. Okay, great.